Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. There are announcements in your bulletin. I ask you to look at those. Though I do go on vacation next week and the following week, uh, you will have, well, Sundays that is, you will have uh, Annabelle Williams Blagan, wonderful person, uh, coming here to preach. And apparently she's going to go down to Minneapolis too. Let's hope she makes it this time. Last time she preached here two years ago, she went down, was going to go down to Minneapolis and somehow ended up in Lone Tree. <laughs> At which point they said, when she called, they said, just go home. <laughs> Bible studies are as normal. And we do have the worship service over there at the care center, Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. As always, I invite you to come and uh, help the residents by participating. And lastly, since I'm gone the next two Sundays, the 30th, we are going to be gone, all of us, from here, because we're going to be over there at the Methodist Church. That's when we're having our joint worship service. Uh, and I will be preaching. Uh, so I hope that you all are there to invite folks. So that for the community, huh? Ten thirty. That's what I told Pastor Mike, anyways, and Beth, Beth Chempo, and I have agreed on that by email. So that's what's going under the paper. <laughs> yes, ten thirty on the thirtieth. So you'll be able to sleep in a little bit. Are there any other announcements that we need or wish to make at this time? Koinonia is today. Koinonia is today, which I forgot, since she won't be here next Sunday. So I hope you all are ready. Readier than me. Are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? And let's begin our worship as we remind ourselves why we're here. What is the main purpose of humankind? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Let's get our hearts and minds in the framework to do that as we listen to Pamela play A Galilean Hillside.
please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship, which is based on Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will bow down toward your holy temple. I will praise your name. For your unfailing love and your faithfulness. You have exalted your solemn decree. When I call, you answer me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord. When they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord. For the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, God looks kindly on the lowly. Though the lofty, God sees them from afar. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Amen. Let us continue our worship with hymn number 39, Jesus Shall Reign. seated. At this time, instead of our typical responsive reading, we are going to have a vision statement for our responsive reading. This is the this church's vision statement. It is the mission of our church to be a caring church, showing concern for Christian and non-Christian alike. Our goal is to teach biblical truth, developing spiritual growth, with the realization that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. We reach out to others in social ministry, encouraging them to worship with us and become followers of Christ. Praise the Lord. When we come into the holy presence of God, our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. 
people of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. Let us do so by using the unison prayer of confession printed in the bulletin and then by going silently before the Father as individuals. Let us pray. You have called us blessed, O God, and washed us in the waters of grace. You have called us a family, O God, and bound us by the presence of your Spirit. Forgive us, O Holy One, when we try to forget that we belong to you, when we bind ourselves to the illusion of independency, the myth of supremacy, or the fear of what might happen if we placed our trust in something beyond ourselves. Forgive us, O Holy One, and by your forgiveness, free us from all that keeps us bound. In Jesus' name, amen. The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. Now as we come to the time of hearing God's word, please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Gracious God, illumine these words by your spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would have us be. For the sake of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. Our first scripture passage is 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 5, 1, and is found on page 1798 in your pew Bibles. The older we get, the more we are likely to be aware of how much the stuff that makes up our lives is temporary. Circumstances change, people move away, machines break down and have to be replaced. And of course, we know that our own bodies are sooner or later going to stop working. For many people, this is a cause for frustration or even despair. But Paul reminds us that through faith we know that, like Jesus, we will one day be raised from the dead to eternal life with God. 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 5, 1. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. So outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Our gospel reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 to 35, and is found on pages 1556 and 57 in your pew Bibles. 
Having a family member who doesn't follow societal norms can be challenging and sometimes embarrassing. Sometimes it might even be dangerous, not just to that person, but the rest of the family also. Jesus' mother and brothers probably thought they were doing what was best for him and for them in trying to get charge of him and get him back to where they could keep him from causing trouble. But that just showed how little they understood him. Mark 3, 20 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, but the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's always of interest to me how different things look to different people. No matter what the event is that's occurring, if you ask folks, you'll get a slightly different perception or perspective. That's why they prefer to have multiple witnesses, for instance, for an accident, because people may, they saw it from different angles or they interpret it different ways. And what we see in both of these passages today is a difference in perspectives. In the Corinthians passage, Paul has been talking about how God has been with him and has kept him even though he was beaten but not crushed and all those things previously. And he goes into why this happens. Because he spoke about Christ, which Lord is more important than his own life. And he does this not only because God gave him that impulse. In 1 Corinthians, he actually talks about it as a compulsion to preach the gospel. I use that for my ordination. Since I got called to a second career ministry, I felt in many ways like it was a compulsion to have to preach the gospel. Uh, although I admit it was not against my will, since after fighting it for 12 years, I, I said yes. But because this, he doesn't lose heart. Even as he gets sick and weak and painful and pained, 
He says, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. He's in touch with God. He's in touch with the Spirit of Christ. And he considers all the issues that he was having to be a light affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory. I have to admit that, you know, that perspective, I find it difficult to keep an eternal perspective because I'm not sure what eternity is. says, while we look at the things which are not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he's looking for beneath the surface. His perspective seeks to go beyond what's in front of his face. Beyond what he sees when he looks in the mirror in the morning beyond perhaps even the way he feels each day. For we know if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, our soul, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Death is not the end for us. That's a perspective. So many different philosophical pathways that are common in the world today. Death is the end. That's it. There's no afterlife. You get eaten by the worms, turn into dust, you enter the circle of life in a different way. I remember a bumper, or a, yeah, a bumper sticker, I think it was, uh, who somebody had on it said, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's his perspective. I'd say that somebody else replied, he who dies is dead. <laughs> so, you know, but we get to say both of those are wrong in our perspective if we keep an eternal perspective in mind. In our passage from Mark, Jesus has come to a home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent they could not even eat a meal. They just apparently broke into the house and, you know... I, and we know that that happened elsewhere because like in Matthew, you know, they, they chopped a hole in the roof in order to lower somebody down. People were determined to see Jesus. And so he got these huge crowds in the middle of town. Now, we all know what happens if you get a huge crowd in the middle of town. The authorities generally take a dim view of it. Okay, because they're afraid that it might spontaneously break out into something more destructive or violent or things like that. And certainly, despite the fact that we tend to have this view of Jesus and we call him the Prince of Peace, uh, the authorities saw him as a rabble rouser. That was their perspective. And in many ways he was. Let us not forget when he overturned the tables of the money lenders in, in the temple and drove out the animals and then the people, freed the animals and drove out the people that were doing all that stuff. This is not the act of someone who is a, I would say, a pacifist pansy or pansy. A lot of way, times the way they display or uh, show Jesus in movies and things like that drives me nuts. Their perspective is wrong because he, he was a rough carpenter. That's what his dad did. I mean, I, I think he probably could have made cabinets and, and chairs and things like that. And maybe he did, but the fact of the matter is his, his father was called a tecton. 
And that's a rough carpenter. It's somebody that, it's construction. He puts up frameworks of houses. If he was alive today, he'd be putting up drywall and mudding it. And things like that. Cutting and shaping and putting things in place. Wooden flooring. And most of them had to cut their own trees and shave them down and then even drag the lumber to the place. And if they didn't drag the lumber, if they happened to have a cart with a horse or whatever, uh, they still had to load it and unload it. I, he was probably pretty, pretty buff and probably had scars, not just the scars we think of with the nails, but scars on his arms and things from... I know we say he's perfect, so he would have never made a mistake when he was trying to cut down something or hammer a nail and hit his thumb, right? Well, I think he might have. His family's worried. When they see all these people gathering around him and everybody knows that he's the center, the core, the reason, they say... We need to go get him. Because he's gone nuts. This whole situation is nuts. I sometimes wonder about that perspective since Mary, who's mentioned specifically, she knows who he is. I mean, she had an angel announce it. My only guess is that while she knew who he was, she was concerned for his safety. And this is the way they were going to keep him safe. They were going to bring him home, maybe lock him away for a little while in his bedroom, let the crowds die down, let the people die down, let the hoopla die down. The scribes also showed how the authorities didn't like what Jesus was doing and the crowds he was gathering. And so they tried to change the perspective of the people by saying he's possessed by Beelzebul, the father of lies. And he casts out demon by the ruler of the demons. Because remember, Jesus had not just done healing, but he had cast out a lot of demons. And so Jesus calls them to himself. He, he apparently knows their thoughts, he, or he hears their words. Uh, we're not sure whether they were outside at first, but he calls them inside to him. And in front of all the people there, asks them some questions and gives a parable. Showing how their perspective is wrong. How what they claim is true is not and cannot be. No matter what your perspective. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now, civil war, that's, you know, civil war tears countries apart. And frequently, historically, during a civil war, somebody else from the outside will come in and take over. They even have agents that can instigate things like that, or they used to. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. So he goes down a level to families. That's what it is, a household. Family has a real problem coming together and being successful and keeping together if they're divided against themselves. The stresses are so great and the scars are so terrible. It's one of the things that makes divorce so traumatic for children and makes it so difficult to have a blended family if someone remarries. I think it's a good thing when they do. Don't get me wrong. 
but they've kids have already seen a house divided against itself. They've already seen it fall. And that fear is not something that goes away easily. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. So before you can plunder someone's house, before you can steal people, in this case, he would have need to have tied up the spirits of all these people. And he says, Truly I say to you, and this is confusing to some people, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. He was showing them that their perspective of claiming that he was inspired and inhabited by Beelzebul when he had clearly shown by his acts and his words that he was sent from God. And remember, prophets, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and all that. They assume that the Spirit is within these men and women. That they are blaspheming against that Spirit, directly against God. Their unbelief condemns them. How can you achieve salvation? How can you be given salvation, I should say? We can't achieve it on our own. If you can't believe in the God who gives it to you. If you refuse to believe, if your perspective is it's just a myth, a bunch of stories or God doesn't fit my perception of what God should be so therefore God isn't that's what I hear the most and I'm sure you do as well these days if there was a God he wouldn't do this that or the other or he wouldn't even allow this that or the other and thus we put our own perspective first short-sighted, finite, temporary as it is, over God's eternal perspective. And that doesn't mean that it's easy to accept. That's where trust and faith come in. As we trust God's perspective over our perspective while working to see and understand and bring about God's perspective. And the final thing that comes in this passage in Mark is his mother and brothers finally arrived. You know, it says elsewhere he had four brothers. And standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. So they didn't even go in the house. They just said, yo, get out of here. And so the crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. The scribes might have been going, yes, maybe in their hearts. And Jesus says a very, what some people consider to be one of his hard sayings. Who are my mother and my brothers? He looked around and said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. It was the people doing the will of the Father, following Christ, that he considered family. Even more so than his blood kin. And that's a hard thing for us to hear. We talk about blood is thicker than water, but really the waters of baptism, according to Christ, are thicker than blood. 
I guess it depends on your perspective. But Christ seemed to believe that those who follow Him, those who accept Him as Lord and Savior, are closer to Him than blood kin. And in many ways, as Christ does, so should we. We don't cast off our blood kin, but we have to make sure that we understand the depth of relationship with each one of us here in this family of God. And with the greater family. It's one of those reasons why Presbyterians love to do ecumenical stuff, like we're going to do on the 30th. Because then we get different groups, families of God, all gathering together in a greater family of God. Kind of sort of like having a reunion, I guess. Where you get to see your second and third cousins, maybe, that you haven't seen in a while. And that's because our perspective is, that's how important our relationships with each other and Christ and in Christ and through Christ are. Both really are messages of hope, both sets of passages. For Paul, there was no reason to give up because he knew what was to come. There was no reason to fear because he knew that what was in front of him was not necessarily what was reality. And it's a message of hope for us in that God has given us a way to enlarge our family. You don't have to be alone. God promised we'd never be alone, and He is with us always. But there's a lot of lonely people in the world. They say you can be surrounded by a crowd and still be lonely. But not, I think, if you have a loving relationship with them. I would hope, no matter what your situation is, in your life at home, whether you're a widow or a widower, or you were an only child, or whatever it might be, you're living on your own, and had or didn't have a spouse or partner, that you would understand that while you may be single, you're not alone. We are here for you. And God will pick up the slack where we can't be if you trust in Him. And that perspective may get you through a whole lot of life. As we get older, as we get frailer, as we go through all the things in life that can wear us down, so that we can continue to know joy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It seems strange to say, let's stay seated when we're singing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. But if you would turn to number 440, we will sing that.
God is with us. And God has blessed us. And as his people, as his children, we should help to continue his work here in his creation. And so as Pamela plays our offertory, I would ask you to meditate on how God has blessed you and how you might give back in various ways to his work in this community and beyond. If you would please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. O oh God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts. Use them even as you use us to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. Please be seated. Another one of those ways in which we show our care and our concern is as we pray for and with each other. There are people who are listed in your bulletin. I ask you to look at them, pray for them by name. Whether you know their situation or not, God does. Seeing none, let's come before God in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise. You are an awesome God. You're an awesome Father. You provide all our needs. Needs we don't even know we have. Sometimes needs we don't want. Because we want something else. But you know better. Lord, we give you thanks that you are so patient with us, pouring out your grace continuously upon us, showing us your mercy with every breath we take. We give you thanks for the greatest gift of salvation, something we couldn't do on our own, a way to meet your justice and your holiness and to overcome the price of sin, which was death. and separation from you for eternity. But out of your love and in your wisdom, you made a way for us to come back to you. And Jesus came and lived among us, 
changing people's perspectives, showing them the way, the truth, and the life. Dying on the cross for us. To cleanse us of our sins. Being raised again for us. So that death might be conquered and we know there's life beyond. Eternal life with you. Sending the Holy Spirit to be within us at Pentecost. As we're adopted as your children and your family. Lord, it is so much greater than we could have ever thought up or imagined on our own. We just thank you now with our, all our hearts. And in that gratitude, we ask that you would pour blessings upon the people who are on our list, folks that are in care centers, folks that have had surgery, folks that are recovering from infections, folks that are going to have surgery, maybe even now. Lord, we pray your spirit would be upon them. You would guide the hands and eyes of the doctors, that their bodies would be strengthened, and even more so their mind and their spirit. Lord, may they feel your presence and know you are there. And give it over to you. Remembering the words of Paul that these afflictions are light compared to the eternal weight of glory to come. Lord, it's especially hard when you've lost a loved one. Whether it be a, a family member that's a father or a brother or a son, especially though a baby. Lord, we just never can understand that in our hearts. We pray for comfort for those people. And they know that peace that passes all understanding that only comes from you as they understand that they're still in your hands. You haven't forgotten them. You're with them. May they feel your presence. May they know your power to overcome this trauma, this trial. And may they remember your promise that this isn't the end. We will see those folks again that we love. Because death is not the end. Because you have overcome death. Jesus, come back soon. Bring that new world, that new creation into being. With no more sickness, no more pain, no more death. As all are one in you and declare you as Lord and Holy Spirit given to us until that day be with us giving us wisdom to have the right perspective to see things as you see to never forget the important under the urgency of the, or tyranny of the urgent. And Holy Spirit, give us courage to proclaim your good news, to live lives that honor God, a Father. And give us perseverance so that we can overcome the world, those obstacles the world places before us, our own sin nature. Help us, Lord, so that one day we can hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Holy Spirit, be poured out on this church. Strengthen its people, keep them from evil. 
May this church be seen as a light in the darkness of this world and its people be beacons of joy and of hope that lead others to know of your love, your grace, your mercy. Because we know it for certain ourselves. And Lord, may all that we do and all that we say be forever to your praise and your glory. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. standing and let us sing number 337 God of grace and God of glory <clears throat>
How many of you go forth from this place recharged and renewed? Ready to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Seeing things from God's perspective as you share the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.